find ourselves here today in Acts chapter 13, starting at verse 13, and we're following the Apostle Paul and his uh, group of people. There's Barnabas with them. There's a younger guy named John Mark with him, and they're making their way through the ancient Roman world on what most people call his first missionary journey. I don't think they called it the first missionary journey because they didn't know there was going to be a second or a third at that time. It was just going out because the Holy Spirit sent them as they waited on the Lord together there in their congregation at Antioch. So now verse 13, chapter 13, we read. Now when Paul and his party set from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. That's just one verse, but there's actually a lot of very interesting things that happen in that one verse. I don't know if you noticed, first of all, in verse 13, it describes a change in this group of people that are going along. And the words are contained right there where it says, and Paul and his party set sail. You know, the missionary group is now called Paul and his party. If you look before, previously in Acts chapter 13, it wasn't called that. Previously in Acts chapter 13, usually the phrase used to describe this group was Barnabas and Saul. Well, now since they're going out into the Roman world, it's going to refer to Ro uh, Paul's Roman name, which was Paul itself. So the emphasis will be on Paul and not on Saul, even though Paul the Apostle and Saul of Tarsus, it's the same guy. But you notice the order of the way that it's described. No longer is it Barnabas and Saul. Now it's, right there, verse 13, Paul and his party. From this point on, Paul's leadership and Paul's prominence will be evidence. And, and you know, there's something really kind of wonderful about this. Paul approached this group and par became part of this group at, at Barnabas' invitation, and Barnabas was sort of the lead guy on it. Okay, great. But then just as the process of time and God's gifts and God's enablings and then sort of a beautiful transition by the Lord, Paul rose to prominence and seemingly Barnabas was fine with it. But Lord, I see what you're doing here. So let's give Paul the preeminence and we'll be part of his party, so to speak. Now we also read in that verse a second interesting thing. It says they came to Perga. You see, they left the island of Cyprus and they came to Perga on the mainland of what is today modern Turkey. So they go across the water to the mainland of the continent, leaving Paphos, where God did so many wonderful things there in that city of Paphos. And now they come back to the mainland of what is today modern Turkey. And then we're told the third thing that happened that's sort of of interest there in verse 13. It says, John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Again, I want to clarify the name here. This is John, but it's not the Apostle John. It's not another John. This is a fellow who actually, as so many did in the ancient world, had two names. He was known as John Mark. This is the same fellow who later on would write the Gospel of Mark. This was a guy that was sort of a resident of Jerusalem. And as a young man, he sort of followed around Jesus and the apostolic company as they did their ministry, at least in Jerusalem and maybe beyond. And he became part of this group that was going about, yes, Barnabas, yes, uh, Paul will go with you on the missionary journey. And you should know as well that John Mark was a cousin to Barnabas. Okay, we'll go out and then we'll go out and we'll do this and we'll go out and do this ministry. And then what happened? Well, for some reason, when they get to the mainland here on the, what is modern-day Turkey, in this area known as Asia Minor, they get to this area, and he says, no, I'm going home. Look at verse 13, departing from them, return to Jerusalem. We don't know why exactly. Maybe he was homesick. Maybe he was afraid of the difficult journey that was in front of them. Maybe he resented that the team of his cousin Barnabas was now no longer Barnabas and Saul. Now it was Paul and his party. Maybe he lost confidence because as we're going to see, Paul the Apostle was suffering a bout of bad health right here. But for whatever the reason was, he departed the group and he said, see ya going back home to Jerusalem. Now listen, it's going to be clear from later on in the book of Acts, and you just have to wait till we get to chapter 15 to get to this. But it's going to be clear as we get later on in the book of Acts that Paul didn't appreciate this. Later on, when John Mark wants to say, yes, let me join you again for another trip, you know what Paul's going to say? Forget it. You wash out. 
You quitter? You going back to Jerusalem guy? You won't be part of my group. And later on, we're going to see that that actually occasioned sort of a dispute between Paul and Barnabas. And they split ways over the issue of would John Mark join their company or not? Look, I'm going to reserve a fuller discussion for that when we get on to Acts chapter 15. But I just will say this. Isn't it fascinating that, that even here you have the great apostle Paul. You have the unbelievable son of encouragement, Barnabas himself. And you know what? They still had problems, didn't they? Isn't this refreshing for us to know? I mean, honestly, sometimes we think that, listen, if we really love the Lord and walk at certain level, we'll just never have problems with other people. Would you please get that out of your mind? <laughs> Matter of fact, I'll go so far as to say this. The problems that we may have with other people from time to time are divinely appointed, right? Isn't there something that God wants to work in your life or in the life of that other party through this sort of friction that you have with them? Oh, listen, this is divinely appointed from God. Nobody should think that they're failing because they have some friction with another believer. No, your success or failing is shown in how you deal with that friction with the other believer. Sometimes I hear about it. Well, this person's in a snit with this other person, and it's all some sort of argument. I don't really care that the argument exists. I want to know what they do with it. Do they respond in a godly way? Do they show love and compassion and forgiveness and forbearance? It's not the existence of friction that's so bad. We should expect that among believers. No, 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 no. It's what we do with that friction. That really shows where we're at with the Lord Jesus. And anyway, they still had their problems, but they're going to go on here now, verse 14, without John, Mark, and their company. Notice what it says. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. Okay, maybe I should just stop right there. Maybe when, remember when I told you several weeks ago about the city Antioch that, that was, we called it Syrian Antioch or Antioch on the Orontes. And I told you about the guy who founded it and he had like this compulsive disorder that made him found cities named Antioch. Well, this is another one of them right here. <laughs> Literally, this, this guy founded like uh, uh, 12 or 15 cities named Antioch sprinkled around the Roman Empire. Well, here's another one. So this is a different Antioch. They are not back home. They're at Antioch in Pisidia. I'll start again. Verse 14. But when they had departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Perga was a coastal harbor city where the ship from Paphos came to the mainland. But then they went to Antioch in Pisidia, which was something like 120, 130 miles inland to the north. This general region was known as Galatia. And later, Paul wrote a letter to these young believers in these several churches that he would found on this first missionary journey in Galatia. And that book, To the Galatians, is found in our New Testament library, is it not? Again, this is something a lot of people, they think that there was a city called Galatia because there was a city called Ephesus, right? There was a city called Corinth. There was a city called Philippi. But there was no city called Galatia. Galatia refers to a region, and there were several cities within that. And this Antioch in Pisidia, this is one of those churches there. Now, it's very interesting. Why did Paul go here? Why this area to the north? There's cities all around them. What led them to go there? We don't know for certain, but I will say this. We know that when Paul came to Galatia, when he came to Antioch in Pisidia, he was hurting. He was in bad physical health, and many people believe, we can't prove it with certainty, but I'll just throw out the suggestion to you there. Many people believe that Paul went from Perga up to Antioch, because there's a quite a distance in elevation. Perga, of course, would be at sea level. It's a port city, right? Antioch in Pisidia was at 3,600 feet. You're going up a long, up the mountain pass. You're going up to a city that's at least in the low mountains. And listen, many people went up to Antioch and Pisidia, or at least that general area, to escape the malarial fevers that afflicted people at the lowlands. And there was a lot of that. And some people think 
that this is what was bothering Paul, and this is why they went up. They went to a place where he could do ministry, but he could be in a more helpful environment. Let, let me show you what kind of hurt and condition the Apostle Paul was in. It's from Galatians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. He says this to the Galatians about his arrival there in Antioch. He says, You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. Notice it. Because of physical infirmity. Isn't that what he says? So that, that no doubt had some influence as to why he went there. Then verse 14, And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Uh, apparently, and again, we wish we knew more about this, but apparently God guided Paul to Antioch through some kind of illness that he suffered. And he went to a place where he could recover better. So he comes into Antioch. He's there in the region of Galatia. And what's the first thing that he does? Look at it at the end of verse 14 and the beginning of verse 15. It says this, that he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and sat down. And after reading the law of the prophets, he began to speak at their invitation. Now look, a first century synagogue service would go something like this. This was the general order that they followed. They offered some opening prayers. Then there was a reading from the law. That's the first five books of the Bible. Then there was a reading from the prophets of the Old Testament. And then if there was an educated or distinguished guest in their midst, they would say, well, sir, you're here today. Would you like to comment on what we've just read or what we've just discussed? And Paul walks in there and they noted because of the way he dressed and his bearing and maybe his conversation, well, this is an educated man. This is a man who studied at the feet of Gamaliel. This is a man from Jerusalem. This is a man who's a rabbi. Distinguished sir, would you like to say something to us here today at our synagogue service? And Paul says, really? I'm surprised that you'd ask me. No, he wasn't surprised at all. He walked into the synagogue knowing that the invitation would come. And so when they said, verse 15, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on, he was right on it and he was ready to preach to them Jesus. And he starts now at verse 16. Now, I need to say a little bit of something about these sermons that we hear from Paul, because as we make our way through the book of Acts, we're going to see Paul preach sermons in different places in different settings. One thing you need to understand is I think we can, we can take it for granted that these sermons are, well, what would I say? Um, abridgments, shortened virgin, versions. What would you say? What's the word for that? Um, uh, abbreviations. I'm thinking of a different word. Readers, condensed. Readers Digest condensed books. That's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> As you just have to follow my train of thought. I don't know how it gets there. <laughs> but these sermons are condensed. Now, I, all right, little preacher's confession here. I feel like I need to tell you that the sermons are condensed because when you read this message, you can read it in like less than five minutes. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, the Apostle Paul preached a pretty good message in five minutes. Why is David taking 35 or 40 minutes? All right, well, I'm going to insist that what Luke communicates to us are condensed versions, right? That he could have gone on in much greater depth than any one of these points. They're true, they're accurate, but they're condensed. He's going to get to the point, and we'll notice this as we make our way through these different messages. Are you ready for this? Verse 16, do you got the picture in your mind? Is the movie running in your head? Here's Paul in a synagogue of the first century. You're not in Jerusalem. You're not in Judea. You're out among the Jews of the diaspora, right? Scattered around the Roman Empire. But these are Jewish people. They love the Lord. They're gathered there on the day of the synagogue service. And there's Paul in their midst, and he's going to speak. Verse 16, then Paul stood up. And motioning with his hand, don't you love that? Motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. 
So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. Isn't that a beautiful way to begin this message? First he begins standing up, <clears throat> clearing his throat, motioning with his hand, and addressing the people there saying, men of Israel and you who fear God. By the way, that shows us something, that it was somewhat of a mixed multitude there in that synagogue. There were Jewish people, that's men of Israel, but there were also people there who were Gentiles, yet they were friendly to Judaism. That's the men who fear God. He's speaking to both groups here. I see there are Jews and Gentiles present here, but you're all interested in the things of the God of Israel. So let me speak to you. And what he does is he gives just sort of that brief, brilliant summation of the history of Israel, right? He talks about the forefathers in the land of Israel. He talks about their time in Egypt. He talks about the Exodus. He talks about their years in the wilderness. He talks about the taking of Canaan. He talks about what God did under Saul. And then he brings it all to the point of King David and what God promised to King David, culminating in that great verse in verse 23. After that survey of Israel's history, he says this, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. Now this is one of the great sort of things I gotta deal with every time I stand before you to bring forth the word of God is I gotta deal with the idea, and what kind of depth do I go into each particular verse? And look, I look at a section like this, and I go, isn't it marvelous to see how you can recount what God did in each one of these places? What God did through the patriarchs, what God did through their time in Egypt, what God did through the Exodus, and their years in the wilderness, and on and on. But listen, I think that the main point to drive home here is exactly what Paul drives home in verse 23 that God was guiding Israel all throughout its history so it would come to this point where it leads up to Jesus and brings him forth. Is that really the point? When you study the Old Testament, when you see what God does through each individual book of the Old Testament, yes, it's wonderful to see what God was doing in each individual situation, and there's things for us to learn from that, but make no mistake, it all points to Jesus. It all is for the bringing forth of who he is and what he would do for us, especially on the cross. And this survey of Israel's history, it demonstrates that God has a plan for history, right? History isn't just aimless. History isn't the movement of a pinball and a pinball machine bouncing all around aimlessly, sometimes hitting a prize, sometimes losing. No, that's not the idea of history. God is guiding history. He's directing it. He's moving it. And we need to sense a connection with that plan. Jesus is the goal of history. And if you're in Jesus Christ, you're in the flow of God's great plan of redemption. That's what Paul's trying to point out to them. It all culminates in Jesus. Now, in verse 24, he's going to go on and talk about what John the Baptist had to say about Jesus. Look at it here, verse 24. After John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to lose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them con condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. This is fascinating. After giving the survey of Israel's history, now he comes down to telling them about Jesus. But I find it very interesting that when he's telling them about Jesus, he doesn't begin with Jesus. Rather, who does he begin with? With John the Baptist. I don't know about you, I'm just sort of fascinated by this. I'm fascinated by the fact where he says in verse 25 that as John was finishing his course, he said, that's all he refers to him as is John. John. 
I'm fascinated by the fact that the ministry of John the Baptist was well known throughout the Jews of the Roman Empire. Later on, Paul's going to go to a city of Ephesus, which is even further away from Jerusalem. They knew John the Baptist. It's just fascinating. For whatever reason, John the Baptist's ministry was so notable, was so publicized, people knew who he was, and they knew the message that he preached. So Paul could just walk into a synagogue and go, yeah, you know John and the message that he preached. Go, yes, of course, we've heard of this guy, John the Baptist. But he used it to bring forth the idea that John the Baptist pointed forth to Jesus. And he said, listen, Jesus is the point of John the Baptist's ministry. That's why he told you to repent. He's the Messiah that he told you to get ready for. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist, he wanted to glorify. He wanted to lift up Jesus so much that in verse 25, it says that John the Baptist said, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. You know, it's a very interesting phrase that John the Baptist used to exalt Jesus. Because in the ancient world, there were all these rules, there were all these protocols for how to handle it when a rabbi had his disciples. But this was a common way. In the ancient world, in the first century world, if you wanted to be a rabbi, you couldn't go really to rabbinical school or to the first seminary that trains rabbis or this or that. What you had to do if you wanted to be a rabbi was you had to attach yourself as a disciple to another rabbi. Well, they had rules for how the rabbi could treat the disciples that he had under him and how the disciples were to respond to the rabbi. Because some rabbis became like tyrants over their disciples. They said, well, great, you're my disciple. Go wash my chariot or whatever it was. I don't know whatever it would be. <laughs> well, there were limits to what a rabbi could expect of his disciples. And one of the written down limits said this. If a rabbi asks his disciple to untie his shoes or his sandals, that's going too far. The disciple can say, no, I don't have to do that. So do you see, isn't it interesting that John the Baptist takes this very interesting phrase and he says, you know what? I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. That's how great Jesus is, and that's how small I am. And John the Baptist, like every faithful preacher, he exalted Jesus. He showed how great Jesus was, and by contrast, how small he was. And even though John the Baptist understood it, not everybody did, because look at verse 27. It says, for those who dwelt in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him. John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. But the rulers in Jerusalem did not. Isn't that sad? They didn't catch on. Jesus was right there. The prophets testified to who he was. They should have understood it, but they didn't. And therefore, Jesus was executed and laid in a tomb. I find it very interesting, the phrase that he used in verse 29, where he says, they took him down from the tree. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought Jesus hung on a cross, not on a tree. Well, no, he was hung on a cross of wood, but here, somewhat symbolically, the Apostle Paul calls it a tree because he's connecting with some Old Testament scriptures that these Jewish people in the synagogue would have been very aware of. By the way, let's remember where he's preaching. He's preaching in a synagogue. He's preaching to them people who had heard the Hebrew scriptures, who knew them, who understood them. And as he spoke in the synagogue, he said, listen, they hung Jesus on a tree and they took him down from the tree. Did you know that in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that God will curse a person who hangs on a tree. Later on, when Paul wrote to the Galatians, he fleshed this out even more. He said, Jesus took the curse on the tree that we deserved. And this is the point that he's trying to get to them this day on this synagogue. Well, now, verse 30, Paul's just getting warmed up. Look, he says, they crucified him. They hung him on a tree. They laid him on a tomb. But now look, verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He's spoken thus, 
I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. You know, I love how the verse 30 begins there. But God. Isn't that great? Two of the most wonderful words in the New Testament in the Bible period. But God. Man took the Savior and hung him on a cross. Man treated him disgracefully. Man poured out all the hate and venom he could muster against the sinless Son of God. But God raised him from the dead. Aren't you happy for the but gods in your life? You should be. You messed up your life as bad as you could, but God changed you, didn't he? You, you were going off in one direction. You were making everything as bad for yourself as you possibly could, and for others, I might add. But God, he changed you, right? Some of you, you're here right now, and you need that kind of change in your life. Well, that's what God's here to do for your life. He, he's here to be the one that says, stop. Let's change. But God, you were going your way, doing your thing, and it was bringing nothing but sorrow and sadness in your life. But God changed it. And that's what he did here in the glorious resurrection of Jesus. Man did his worst against the Savior, but God raised him from the dead. And the fact is simply stated. And then Paul goes on to declare with evidence from eyewitnesses, saying that he was seen for many days by those who came up with him. Look, lots of people saw him. He was raised from the dead. But by the way, maybe I should just pause and make something here, an idea put forth. That we should not miss the emphasis in Paul's preaching. It's not so much on what we would call theology, is it? He's not saying... Let me discuss with you some theological postulates that have been fascinating me lately. It's really not the tone of it, though there's definitely theological content to what he's saying. I'm not saying that theology is absent from what he's teaching at all. But what's the emphasis? On events. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was buried in a tomb. Jesus rose from the dead. Believe it and understand what it means to your life. Friends, our belief as Christians, the foundation of our faith, it's not based on theological speculations. It's not based on a burning in our own bosom. It's not based on how you may respond to or how you may think of the Christian life. You know what the foundation of the Christian life is? Things that God did in time and space and history that we can all connect to. Because I'll tell you the truth here. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. But the truth of the matter is, on a certain day, at a certain time, at a certain place, Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins. And three days later, he rose from the dead. That's the truth. That's the proclamation that Paul offered. And we need to come back to this time and time again. Our faith is not founded on subjective experiences. Our faith is founded on historical events. It's not primarily a set of ethics, though it involves net ethics. It's not primarily a set of theology, though it definitely connects with theology. The real of it, the core of it is historical events. That's what Paul's preaching to them. So he takes those historical events that had happened 15 or 20 years previously, and now, verse 33, he says, but God has fulfilled this for us, their children. That resurrection of Jesus, it's for you today. It didn't just happen, and we say, well, just another great event to fill the history books. No, it has meaning and importance for you and for I today. Jesus is risen, and his work on the cross was utterly utterly accepted to the point where he quotes these wonderful Old Testament passages speaking about the resurrection from the mouth of David the king and the prophet well all of that's wonderful you and I may sit through this we go yes Paul preach it it's great but now we come to verse 38 where well I'll be honest I fear I may lose some of you right here not, not lose you because you can't follow it you can understand it perfectly I don't doubt anybody's ability to understand this I may lose some of you because what he discusses beginning of verse 38, it's hard to hear. Are you ready for this? Verse 38. Therefore, in other words, in light of all that I've said, in light of who Jesus is and what he did for us, both in his work on the cross and the resurrection, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, 
that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. Can you just picture Paul saying those words? in front of that synagogue audience on that day? The, the first part, starting at verse 38, that's really good news. I imagine Paul said that with a great big smile on his face. He told him about what Jesus did on the cross and how he rose from the dead. And he goes through this man, this resurrected Jesus, I'm preaching to you the forgiveness of sins. Friends, that's a great promise, isn't it? Because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of his glorious victory in the empty tomb, your sins can be forgiven. I'll say it again. Your sins can be forgiven. Notice that I, I don't even know how to say it. I, I use the word sins. That sounds like such a churchy word sometimes, doesn't it? You don't use that context out of church very often unless you're describing a dessert that you shouldn't eat, but you're going to eat anyway, right? <laughs> And so I wonder, well, maybe I should define sin in a different way. Maybe I should use it. Other, because even though I know it's sort of a churchy word, at the same time, you know what I'm talking about, right? I dare say, if there's somebody, must, you just wandered in off the street. For some reason, your GPS was misprogrammed and it led you right here instead of where the, you're going to meet somebody. But here you are. I dare say, if you just walked in off the street, you don't have any familiarity with Jesus or the Bible. You still know what I'm talking about when I say sin, don't you? It's the wrongs that you've done. It's the things that you've done that you shouldn't have done. And it's the things you've left undone that you should have done. All of that collectively together. Your guilt before God and man, that's your sin. Now, can I ask you, how are those sins ever going to be forgiven? What are you doing? Oh, you're going to be a good girl. And a good girl enough that will make up for all your sins. The Bible tells you it'll never happen. It just can't happen that way. No, you can't do it. You can't be good enough, long enough, uh, consistently enough to ever do that. None of that wipes out the past. And you know this, right? Next time you get pulled over by the policeman for speeding, right? Just tell him, but officer, I've driven the speed limit on this road 50 times before. And I'll do it now 50 times after. Can I be excused this one? He'll just laugh and say, sign here, please. Because if you've sinned, your good conduct before or your good conduct after, it doesn't cancel it out, right? Time won't forgive your sin. Many people think this. Death in and of itself won't forgive your sin. No, but I'll tell you what can forgive your sin. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because as he hung on the cross, all the guilt, all the shame, all the penalty, your sin and my sin deserved, it was placed upon him. And he bore it in his own body. We can't justify ourselves before God. We can't. But he can justify you if you put your faith in him. That's why it says, and I love this in verse 39, everyone who believes is justified. Everyone. Jesus doesn't only forgive us, but we're justified by him. Forgiveness takes care of a debt, right? But forgiveness doesn't put any positive cash flow, so to speak, in your balance. It just brings you back up to zero justification put something positive in your bank account and you know what you stand before God not just at zero because you're forgiven you're justified you're in that glorious place we have a positive credit before the creator of the universe because of who Jesus is and what he did for you now friends that's the good news I imagine Paul saying all that with a great big smile on his face I'm offering you forgiveness I'm offering you in a way to be in a positive credit so to speak before God this is good news and nothing but good news but then he says this is the part that's going to be hard to follow with verse 40 beware therefore When God holds out before you such a precious gift of salvation, of forgiveness, of a positive credit before him, justification, if you refuse that gift, that's a heavy guilt upon your head. Beware, therefore, 
watch out. It's a warning that if we don't embrace the person and the work of Jesus with our whole lives, look at the words used there in verses 40 and 41. We are despisers who will perish. And in this warning, Paul quoted a passage from Habakkuk regarding the judgment that came upon Jerusalem. And this is what he's applying to the people there in that day at that synagogue. He's saying, listen, all of you, a beautiful gift is offered to you in Jesus Christ. And here's the gift. If you refuse it, just as God judged Jerusalem in the ancient world, God's judgment is going to come upon you as well. Those are hard words for me to say to you. But how can I not say them? How can I not deliver the message as it's just given to me and to you in the Bible? You, you, you think that rejecting Jesus is just a matter of, uh, of personal preference. Uh, Coke instead of Pepsi, something like that. Well, I'll do it or I won't do it. And, and you see, we don't want to manipulate you, do we? No. We're not trying to turn the screws. Oh, you got... But, I have to tell you, at the end of the day, if you reject him, if you look at what Jesus did for you on the cross and you turn your back on it, if you don't want it, if you reject him, there's going to be judgment for you. I don't say that happily. I, I say it looking at every face in this room, pleading with you. Why, why reject him a day longer? Why live your life in this separation from him that you've chosen? I love preaching to you the good news. And it's great news. It's the best news ever that you can be forgiven, that you can be justified. But we have to admit that there's, there's a corollary. There's an attachment to the good news. The price is very, very heavy for you to reject it. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, the one will declare it to you. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets comes upon you. Father, I pray that you would um, speak to hearts now that you would give us a sense here, Lord, of your goodness and your presence. But Lord, also of the solemn responsibility that is due to every man, to every woman. That should they reject you. That they will have to answer for that. Lord, I pray that you'd move upon hearts right now as I, as I prepare to invite them to come to you, Lord.